What's up, everybody, and welcome to another Mortgage Coach and Trust Engine interview. Uh, today's interview is something that I am really excited about. We're interviewing Brett McCracken uh, with Stratmore. He's a senior advisor. Uh, he has been doing secret shopping for lenders, um, banks, IMBs. Uh, Brett, how many different secret shopping uh, projects or calls have you been part of, would you guess? Uh, just this year, since the second quarter, like this the other day, we're north of like 32 unique shops, unique yeah. companies. Yeah. yeah. So that's different companies that on behalf of that company, they're doing secret shopping to, to just, sometimes it's a company calling on their, you know, for their own to improve their sales strategies. Uh, we're yeah. going to learn more about that. And, and we're going to talk about why is that so important. So, Brett, if you could, this is the first time I've interviewed you, would you give a little bit about your backstory and, you know, what you're doing with Stratmore right now? Yeah, yeah, you bet. Um, so, yeah, you're right. Senior advisor at Stratmore. About half my week is spent consulting with tech companies uh, in the industry, typically, you know, in the banking orbit. And then the other half is working with the actual lenders, the IMBs, the credit unions, the banks, typically implementing that technology, looking at their strategy, their workflow, um, you know, key performance indicators, data warehouses. So you kind of see how the puzzle gets put together. But it is interesting to watch from, you know, the original demo. This is the software we're thinking about. Now we're going to implement it. And then how does it actually work inside their four walls? And how does it work within the complexity of the rest of their ecosystem? So that tends to take up a, a lot of the week. Yeah, well, I'm looking forward to learning more about secret shopping. I mean, why why should lenders and loan officers do secret shopping? Yeah, great question. I mean, first of all, I, I love a great experience. I think everybody does. And, and typically a great experience doesn't just happen accidentally. You know, sometimes they do organically, but usually if, if you go to a restaurant or maybe you're at a hotel or you're going on some big trip somewhere, um, there has been at least an individual or group of individuals who have really put some thought behind that behind that experience and um i talked to somebody the other day about just the topic of experience in general and it was somebody who's in in the mortgage industry that um their spouse unfortunately is going through a breast cancer um treatment but the individual said they're being treated down at md anderson and said what an amazing experience you're dealing with something so difficult and he said his wife just felt like a VIP from the moment she walked in. There was no waiting. It was all coordinated. And he said the experience was probably just as uplifting to her and to him um, as the treatment plan, how well it was coordinated. So when it comes to a great experience, um, you know, I think it's it's possible <laughs> in many venues, including if you want to get a home loan. But, um, you know, it's it's really I think about the thoughtful planning that goes into it. So to answer your question, you know, why, you know, why should lenders and, and loan officers secret shop? Well, first of all, in 2020 and 2021, nobody cared about this. I didn't spend any of my time on this. I probably spend, um, you know, a good, a good 10 to 12 hours a week on it now, this very topic. But um, what you want to do is you want to evaluate what is the real consumer experience. A lot of these workflows have been set up years ago. Um, and they've not been tested. It's like the old Ron Popeil, set it and forget it. You'll find a splash page that says you'll hear from us within 72 hours. And maybe somebody put that up in 2021 because they were so busy. But the main reason is I think you want to first pressure test your workflow, especially when you have disparate data systems and you jump from experience to experience, um, you know, maybe from a point of sale to an LOS or just from a CRM or even your website. Um, and you can always find areas of improvement. There is a, always an opportunity for quality control. We get a lot for competitive intelligence. Hey, what are our competitors doing? How do they approach this experience? Um, and then the past two weeks, I've been getting more calls about compliance. So lenders are saying, we're kind of concerned with enforcement and we want to be very proactive and we want to make sure that from a compliance standpoint, that we're all buttoned up. So we just combine it all and we give the full secret shop. Here's the consumer experience, the sales experience, and here's the compliance experience and report back on that. So, so, and, and when I add all of that up, it, I come up with um, conversion, compliance, and profitability. You know, like like if you want to, as a lender, optimize, and, and there's, I'm sure there's more to it than that, 
but but I'm gonna I'm gonna show a slide on my screen. This is a um, anonymized case study done by Jim Deitch and or Jim Deutsch, and uh, who, by the way, thank you for helping me get that interview with with uh, with Jim. And and this is an anonymized case study from a uh, um, IMB, and and when you look at conversion. They're losing almost 100 basis points, um, and this this is the loan funnel. This is like the bottom of the funnel, and and most of those, you know, losses are concessions. Let's face it: the type of experience that you give a consumer, whether you're bringing value, um, will have to do whether or not you have to give a concession or not. And it will also have to do with um, the size of the concession. You know, we know that loan officers that are delivering best practice experiences are a lot more profitable. Uh, and then when you look at um, the other place in the conversion, uh, withdrawn loans, you know, they they locked in their loan and they go with another lender. And so at the end of the day, this this is what is killing lenders is like lack of conversion and and lack of profitability. Any any thoughts on that? Yeah, actually, that slide actually bring that slide back up for a second, if you will, because this really drives home the point. And the, the the lights really came on for me. You know, years ago, I remember Scott Payne. He was really the guy that introduced me to the concepts of secret shopping. He did a great job and, and continues to do a great job. We worked together um, still quite a bit. And this is this is what really made the light come on for me is that I've spent a lot of time with really, really good data warehouse folks, right? I mean, very good analysts. And so a lot of banks today, IMBs or credit unions, they tend to have pretty exceptional, especially the top quartile, they have pretty exceptional data, right? Their, their reporting is really good. So from a quantitative standpoint, they're excellent. But I like here, like first touch started, right? That delta of 20,000 right there. When you when you get in the law of big numbers, you say, okay, we went from 30,000 to 20, to 10,000, right? So we, we, we have this, this 20,000 leakage in here. It's not until you're actually looking at the individual experiences and listening to the call recordings and anything you get your hands on about the consumer experience that you start to see and put in, in under the puzzle the missing piece which is the qualitative aspect right if you really want to understand the numbers this is why i think secret shopping is so important is because we'll go randomly you know we'll look at these numbers and say what happens when i call your 800 number oh it's dead right well that's a problem uh, and that happens and so that to me is how all this comes together is you take really good analytics like they do at Terra Verde, right? And those guys are exceptional what they do over there. And if you really want to understand the rest of the story, you go and look at the call notes. You listen to the call recordings if you're doing it compliantly. You just listen in on a conversation and all of a sudden it becomes crystal clear when you put this together with what you hear qualitatively and what you see qualitatively happen with the consumer, these numbers make all the sense in the world. Yeah, you can see it. And and here here was another slide that Jim shared. And you know, the the top tier loan officers, by the way, top tier has nothing to do with how many loans they closed or what their production was. I mean, I shouldn't say it has nothing to do with that, but that's not like you didn't get in the top tier because have how many loans you closed. You got into the top tier because you were profitable on a per loan basis. And in this particular anonymized case study, there were 335 loans. Um they were profitable, top tier loan officers. And then the second tier loan officers, he said, in this particular anonymized case study, they, they were losing 366 a month. But he said, sometimes they're making a couple hundred, sometimes they're losing a couple hundred. But guys, this is the, the biggest problem in the industry right now. You know, um, in the bottom tier, these are the loan officers that are losing, you know, and it's significant amount of money per loan. And I, I can pretty much guarantee you, if you secret shopped, these loan officers versus these loan officers, you would you would see it, you would know, and and you would be able to get more tactical and you know and and call it out from you know from very specifics you know. So I really recommend any lender listening to this right now, head of production, CEO, it, it is time to secret shop your 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 loan officers. And and really understand where where they're winning and where they're doing the right things, and make sure we're shining a light on that. We're calling that out. We're creating best practice playbooks, and where we're doing the wrong things. And if you have a secret shopping experience, you're going to be able to call out 
the the specific um, let's call it wrong things that non best practices versus best practices. So um, first of all, before I go to the next question, anything you want to add or subtract it out? I, I think we've kind of talked about why should people do it: conversion, compliance, and if you want more profits, you could have more profits today. If by the way, you have to do more than secret shop; you have to take action and and actually change some behaviors but secret shopping is kind of the the something that's just not done nearly enough in the market yeah i'll add one thing to what you brought up is when you talk to a bank and you talk to their head of you know head of sales <clears throat> who's your best lo and they'll tell you who it is why is that oh they they do the most units they're the most profitable i never hear they give the best service boy they get a lot of repeat business right um, I think I think that's missing from it right now, which is it's not just about is this person driving a lot of money for the company that that that's important, right? Yeah, you can't run a business if you're not profitable. I get it. But also, are they doing a great job? Do they get a lot of referrals or are they one and done? So that's the one thing I would add to that is if I'm looking at the analytics, I want to see not only are they profitable, but how much repeat business do they have? You know, retail a little bit different, but if I'm a consumer direct shop. I'm really thinking about that is if if I'm giving business and I'm buying leads and opportunity for for my for my loan officers to speak to, do they begin to titrate off of the company provided uh, opportunity because they're doing such a great job and they get so much referral business coming from past customers that not, not come back to them, but also refer their fam family and friends. So that's the only thing I would add to that chart is, um, you know, is there an element of satisfaction for the consumer yeah no 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 doubt well hey i i actually did an interview uh i don't know exactly how long ago it was but let's just say it was it was over a year ago it was a couple of years ago with brian morley who's a you know 100 million dollar top producer he's now the head of production with fulton at the time that i interviewed him he was the number one producer with fulton bank and and he actually secret shopped six different lenders. He was at the time buying a second home, and he thought, you know what, I should I should call a few other lenders. And he did six, and and I interviewed him. He you know he got all their fee worksheets, you know emails, you know he he took notes on you know what did they do well, what didn't they do well, and uh, you know listen to that interview. It was really you know while it was a couple of years old, it's as valuable um, today. Uh, I recommend loan officers add that to their, I don't know if you, you need to do it, I don't know, quarterly. Um, let's put it this way, you should do it at least once a year. I know that for sure. And and uh, there's probably not a lot of value in doing it more than quarterly. Any any thoughts on, because we, we're going to have loan officers watching this, or we're going to have the C-suite watching this. What, what are your thoughts on best practices as to how often lenders and loan officers should do secret shopping? You know, I agree with you at least once a year. Um, one really good experience is go try to get a quote from somebody. So call up, give them whatever scenario you want to be. You know, tell them you're a first time home buyer and you're six to 12 months out. First of all, see if they try to get off the phone with you quickly. That's the most that's the most common thing that we receive. We say, yeah, we're six, 12 months out. I will hear, oh, OK, well, I'll give you a call back in the middle of February. Right. Like they try to get off the phone as quickly as possible. And that's happening today. That happened to me last week on a shop. Um but but literally try to go out and, and get a quote and see what comes back. And, and we've seen things all over the board. We have seen screenshots from Excel and, and like they'll highlight and usually one of the brightest colors, uh, the, the fill of the cell, the numbers they think are most important. I have seen uh, a screenshot of the pricing engine. So you can actually see the rate sheet and they'll take the highlighter out and they will literally highlight the par rate. And I've seen that as a screenshot. Um, and then the most common one is it's manually typed out, typically doesn't include an APR. And there tends to be a lot of banking jargon in there that someone that if they don't do this for a business, they don't, they don't understand what it is. Right. I mean, maybe it's a phrase like PMI. I had someone send something the other day about, uh, what it's indexed to. Right. And I said, well, we didn't have that conversation on the call and we'll talk about the arm index and this, that, and the other, um, it's an enlightening experience when you go out and you try to get a quote from somebody. One, notice how hard it is. I did a shop this morning and the individual said they wouldn't even help me with, with, I said, what's my buying power? I have no idea if I can afford a half million dollar house or a million dollar house. 
And the individual would not help me unless I went online and filled out a co complete application. And he had my credit pulled. And I even said what my credit scores were. I said, well, you know, I, I watch and it's always between 7, you know, 86 and 804. And um, the the loan officer just would not budge. And I, so I, that was the end of the call. After 10 minutes, we're done. So yeah, definitely go out and shop. I would do it once a year and share your findings, right? I mean, I, if I was in an office with 10 people, I'd have 10 people go do it, have a meeting, bring in some lunch. Hey, what did you find? What did you find? I guarantee you'll see some commonality. Yeah. So, so let's, let's talk about, um, you know, how do you conduct a shop? Any lessons learned or, you know, leadership you want to bring to the call and, uh, you know, what, 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 what's the process, you know, what's Stratmore's process for doing this? Yeah. So they're pretty comprehensive shops. You really go out and shed light on, on reality. So we kind of break it down into four key areas. The first one is um, planning. So for our clients, we spend a lot of time saying, look, this is our baseline. This is what we look for for every single shop. But what do you want us to look for in addition to this? And so we have some you know, bespoke angles of that where we can add something in. Um, you know, For example, if it's a bank that has a relationship um, with a real estate company and they'll give you a you know, credit back at closing, which is an interesting time given the lawsuits uh, going on right now for, for real estate agents. But they'll want us to lead down that path. And so we spend a lot of time with the planning. We spend a lot of time saying, what profile do you want? Do you want me to be somebody who's completely inept and knows absolutely nothing about this? Do you want me to have had experience doing it? Do you want me to be ready to buy right now? Do you want me to refinance? Do you want me to present a case where if someone asks the right questions, they're going to find out I've got credit card debt at 26%. And even though rates are 8% today, it would make sense. So we always spend a lot of time saying, what do you want the scenarios to be? We build those out and then we study them. So when you ask, what's my address? You ask what my income is. Where do I work? There is no pause. You say it just like it's from your personal life. So that's the first part. The second part is we engage. And there's a number of ways we do that. We go to lead forms. So we fill those out. How long does it take someone to respond to us? Um, we call the toll-free number. Either if it's, a, if it's a large bank, then we'll call the main number and we'll see how long does it take us to get through Sometimes you find IVR hell and you can't get through to anybody. We'll do partial apps. So maybe someone uses a, a you know fancy point of sale that they have a, as a third party or they, they built it themselves. And we'll get up to the social security and the uh, date of birth and we'll stop and we'll see, do they have a web hook that pushes back to their CRM? Um, does that load into a dollar? Do they call us? If they call us, is it a branded caller ID? Does it come through a suspected spam, right? So all these things we kind of go through and we do it. Uh, we walked into physical branches. And so it's just a lot of work and a lot of little things that we do as we go through the um, the process there. But it's really been eye-opening, I think, for leadership and for loan officers. I kind of have a pet peeve. I try not to start sentences with you should or you need to. I just like to present some facts and let people, you know, make up their own minds. So when, when we get to that uh, third phase, that's the documentation phase. And we do a lot of documentation. Um, those slide decks will get close to 200 slides, depending on how many shops we're doing. Um, per company. And we just say, here's what happened. And here are observations. We document those findings. And then the, the final thing is we, is we give a presentation. Um, it really kind of sums everything up. We, we give our clients the deck beforehand to be familiar with it. And then we'll pull out the highlights. There's just not enough time to go through everything in the deck, but we'll go through with our analysis and say, okay, here's, here's what we found. And what I like about the work that we're doing is it's all building upon additional shops. So while we might be doing 50 or 80 shops for one client, that is being added to the other 800 shops that have already been completed. And so you have a pretty good perspective to say, this is not an anomaly. You know, I know we did 13 shops in this specific way, but I can tell you from looking at other 200 shops we did outside this engagement, this definitely happens pretty often. Right, right, right on, man. Well, that is awesome to hear, and uh, definitely best practices for everyone to follow. I love that four steps: planning, engage, documentation. You know, um, loan officers, even if you're doing this for yourself, document this stuff. You know, have a presentation with your team. Uh, so I love love the four steps. What are what are some of the biggest mistakes that you're seeing in the market? You know, like you know, what are the the common mistakes and things that everyone can learn from on today's call. Yeah. I, I wish the list were shorter, but I mentioned a couple earlier, right? Workflow issues. 
uh, we find a lot of workflow issues. So literally disconnected phone numbers that are on the website. Um, no responses to voicemails, no responses to emails. Um, the um, information provided is not used. So let's say that, let's just use a lending tree lead, for example. I think they get about 22 data points or so. Um, if you go to a web form, we've had some that have been pretty detailed. You know, usually you just say, what's your name? What's your phone number? What do you want? But we've been to some pretty some pretty detailed ones. And I've listened to call recordings in addition to do these shops, listening to these call recordings. And I'm astounded by a number of times that the person who has all the data that's been submitted to him, right? So that consumer spent time, they put their name and their scenario, every question that was asked. And I'll hear the, the loan officer say, so what do you think for a loan amount? What do you think for a down payment? What do you think your credit score is? And they re-ask the same questions. Um, and I think for a consumer, that that's that's frustrating. Uh, slow response times. You wouldn't think this would be a, a problem today, but we're averaging probably about 12 hours. And, and we don't shop at 8 o'clock in the morning. We don't shop at 5 o'clock at night. We don't shop on Saturdays and Sundays. Uh, we don't shop early even during the business hours on a Monday. I know what it's like. The, the opportunity stacks up over the weekend. So... You know, we may do a midday Tuesday, you know, maybe just just after lunch or just before lunch. And we have slow response times. No plans for next steps, you know, when, when the calls end. Um, and the biggest piece we look for is consultation, right? Um, if you tell someone you're a first time home buyer, uh, you're telling them you're ready to shop this weekend. Do you actually get consultation or do you just get here's a rate, here's a fee and go apply online? Um, Garth Graham wrote a really good article that has made the rounds. It was brought up at a dinner last night. It was brought up again uh, earlier this week on another call I was on with a few folks. But um, it's on Stratmore's website. I'm sure if you just type in, you go to Stratmore, just type in Be Human and Garth Graham, it'll come right up. But um, Garth made this really good point. And this, and this is a big takeaway from what we see is that he essentially says, if you were at a party and somebody said, I'm getting ready to buy a house, they would probably, that's awesome. You know, what's the reason? Why are you buying a house? What's going on in your life, right? They would have a very personal conversation with you. He said, what they wouldn't do is say, well, how much are you looking to put down? What's your FICO score? What do you think about moving, right? I mean, you know, what's right. your uh, what's your income? What are your assets, right? It becomes this fire hose of questioning that you get. And so that, that's probably the biggest takeaway that that we get is, is there's no human interaction. There's There's no human connection, which is weird, because I know a bunch of these individuals, maybe not the people we shop, but you know, certainly our clients, we spend a lot of time with loan officers. You go out to dinner with them or you're, you're just talking to them in the office. They're personable individuals. They're really enjoyable to talk to. They have a lot to relate to and engage about. But it's something that when that headphone goes on or they got that phone next to their ear, it's like a flip gets, uh, excuse me, a switch gets flipped and they go into transactional mindset mode and you just you just you know you you lose that interaction for you know do you have a co-bar oh it's your spouse oh you're engaged how did you guys meet you know how's the wedding coming along right we, we've had shops before where we'll drop a nugget and we'll say well you know we're uh we're we're gonna go from two to three and we literally had a loan officer say oh you're having a baby great so you think your credit score is like what 762? Like they just move right on past it. So that's unfortunately probably the biggest find that we have right now is is there's no human interaction. It makes sense that that number you just showed from from Jim's numbers, you go from thirty thousand to ten thousand. I guarantee you, in that twenty thousand delta there, um, there's a lot of those conversations that there was just as Gar said, people not being human. Got it. What are what are you know like? What do you think are the things, I mean, speed to lead, obviously, is probably the biggest factor affecting conversion. What are But what are some of the things that you see impacting conversion and profitability the most within, let's, let's just call it all the touch points and all the, you know, best practices that take place? What do you think? And maybe there's like two or three that impact conversion and profit the most. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I'll give you an example. I spoke at a bank recently and I asked the question. I said, hey, what's one of the best experiences you've ever had with a provider? You know, somebody you were paying money for a service. And uh, one guy in the back said it was, it was his exterminator. He called it his bug guy. And I said, 
okay, I wasn't expecting that, but tell me more. And he said, I've known him for years. He has a key to my house. Like he knows how to get in. And um, he said, he really takes the time to explain everything he's doing or why I'm having the problems I'm having, right? He really educates me while he's there. He never makes me feel stupid. And, you know, he's just a very personal and chatty individual. Um, I think that's probably the biggest key is, and, and you guys have this with your software. It's one of the things I, I you know, I like about it on the, um, you know, on, on the mortgage coach product, I mean, it's trust engine is you're, you're giving options, but you're also helping to introduce what I think consumers want the most, which is decision simplicity. Right. And, and they want that cognitive load to be lowered because I, I have an opinion on something. I'm curious if, if you share this, but I've observed what happens when people are making big financial decisions versus smaller financial decisions. I'll give you a quick example. If you've ever gone through a Lowe's or a Home Depot, wander over, like on a Saturday when they're kind of busy, wander over to the washer and dryer section. People will come with research. They will just be just working that salesperson over. Well, now, what about this? And what about that? I read this online. Well, will you match this price? I mean, they have put hours into this because let's say it's a washer dryer. It's something you're you know using maybe once, twice a week. You've got a family, maybe multiple times a week, a big family. But when it comes to allocations of a 401k plan or it comes to a mortgage, people seem to just want to be done with the process. I don't tend to, to notice they spend as much research and time looking at their options and asking the questions. You know, if it's an investment advisor, they're not saying, what's a 12B1 fee? What's an expense ratio? How much is this really costing me? Right? You don't really hear those questions. It's, oh, this person's got a nice suit. They drove a really expensive car. They must be successful. I'm just going to kind of go with it. But I think that the people who get really comfortable in an uncomfortable situation because they don't feel stupid. The person explains, they take the time, they lay out their options for them. At that point, I don't think price matters. We, we know for a fact, people are willing to pay a premium for a better experience, right? I mean, if you fly on Southwest Airlines, you'll probably spend the extra 20, 30 bucks to get a list or a, you know, early bird uh, boarding because you don't want the cattle call in the sea, right? You don't want the stress of that. So I think that the profitability to me is a direct extension of how comfortable do you make me feel in this very uncomfortable transaction when I am outside of my circle of competence? And am I really going to go shop you somewhere else with someone who's going to be maybe a bit curt and short with me? Um, I think those two, Dave, are, are just directly related to each other. And it's all predicated on how educated do you make me on what's one of the biggest financial transactions of my life. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and, and guys, here's something that we've learned this year here at Trust Engine with our mortgage coach product, because you said the word options, you know, the still the primary experience and how rates are quoted are, are a fee worksheet or an email that says, here's your rate, here's your payment, here's your cash to close. Those are, you know, while it may have more detail on that, I mean, those are the three big data points to the consumer. And, and we know that when you give a family options and, you know, they can see a point or excuse me, two points, one point, zero points, especially in this market with rates as high as they are. Sometimes this will be, you know, um, a non buy down loan with a two one buy down or a three two one buy down or a seller concession buy down. And you're showing them affordability strategies and then another option that we see all the time is where you show them, hey, the future refi, you know, date the rate, marry the house. Like, this is your rate right now to buy the home. And look, we can refinance this. Like when you give a family options versus this, you have higher conversion, you have higher customer satisfaction scores, and, and you have less price concessions. And, and then we also find that when when lenders um, get shopped, which you're going to get shopped in this market, you know, the best practice is not negotiating with um, basis points and interest rates, which are very expensive. Like this is an example of, you know, a loan officer who had a half a percent higher interest rate. And then they, they said, Hey, what is that going to cost the consumer over 12 months? And then instead of negotiating based off an eighth and rate or a quarter or even three eighths and rate, you know, they're negotiating with $500. Like, what if I, you know, gave you $500 or $1,000 credit? And, and here's what we know. Like, we have the data. 
that the loan officers that follow this process, this is the lowest impact we've ever seen. Are six basis points more profitable and 8.7% um, better conversion. Uh, this actually came in recently, where in the month of September, the, the 30 top users of Mortgage Coach at Churchill were 41 basis points more profitable in gross margin than folks that were delivering that fee worksheet. And then like the most we've we've seen is this one, NFM, the 93 loan officers that are giving options that are you know showing what the refi is going to look like, we're actually 65 basis points more profitable than the 319 loan officers that are delivering fee worksheets. Um, what's what's your guess? And I don't know, maybe you even have data that like a great experience, you know, in secret shopping, conversion rate, profitability, a not a great experience. What do you what do you do? You have a, a sense of What's at stake for a lender, um, you know, from a from a concession standpoint, from a conversion standpoint? Any thoughts on that? Well, yeah, I don't have any hard data producing that, but I can just tell you anecdotally from from doing is is those pieces you outlined are are definitely directly connected. When I go out and I get a great experience, I'm I'm explaining the process like what you just brought up, and you showed the multiple options. When we do our shops, it's always roll the dice. Unless someone says, I want you to specifically shop these loan officers. Um, when we go to whether it's a massive bank or a credit union or IMB, we just go through the process that a normal uh, consumer would go through. I'm, I'm hoping that organically we come up against someone who uses your software because I'm curious how they present it, right? Um, I think that if, if I'm seeing it laid out like that as a consumer, um, my first thought isn't necessarily going to be, all right, but what can you do for me? You know, get your pencil out and kind of sharpen that up for me. I'm going to appreciate the education. Now, if I go through an online portal and I fill it out and I have five people calling me, you know, first of all, my phone's going to explode in the first 24 to 48 hours. And depending who those lenders are, it might go on for seven days. But after a couple of weeks, if I talk to one of them, I have a really good conversation. I'm thinking to myself, I don't really want to go back to the other four because I'm comfortable with you. I trust you. And if that's the case, Dave, I'm not thinking to myself as a, as a consumer, all right, now go talk to your sales manager and bring me back a better deal for this, right? Like that conversation may come up, but, you know, if, if you are confident in the transaction that you're about to go through and you feel that you could explain to somebody else as a layperson, here's what I'm doing here, are the reasons why I'm doing it, and you feel very comfortable in that, um, you know, there probably is a premium put on that service and there probably should be, right? I mean, if, you, if you're going to go pay for the best doctor in the world, it's probably worth the premium versus somebody forgetting a sponge in you and, and, and paying at a discount. All right. So let's go into wrap up mode. So just to put this graphically for everyone on this call right now, um, I'm going to give some very specific advice and we're going to close this out. So you've got a leaky bucket right now. I mean, everybody's got a leaky bucket. You're never mm -hmm. in the mortgage business, not going to have some, you know, some concessions and some conversion, but can you make these leaks much smaller? Absolutely. I, you know, we, we know that they could be cut in half. And then and then you also have a even bigger leaky bucket up above the funnel. And by the way, that will be maybe an interesting um project next, you know, at some point to actually call people that are not, you know, you're not you're not secret shopping in the transactional experience, but you're shopping like, hey, these are past customers. We're servicing their loan. And and what kind of experience are they getting? I think that would be interesting. Um but here's here's what I recommend. First of all, if you're a loan officer watching this, forward this to your manager. And I think it would be really fun if someone, a mortgage coach lender, engaged with Stratmore and and did some intentional shopping. You know, you you have loan officers that you know are in that tier one, highly profitable. You know that they're using mortgage coach. Uh, let's give them a few of those folks. Let's give them some people that are are high producing but they're not using solutions. Um, give them some people that actually, you know, maybe it's just some of your worst loan officers 
and you know your your highest and most underperforming. So you really have kind of three tiers. You have people that you know are following your organizational best practices using your technology. You have people that are still successful, but they're not following your call it using all your tech. And you have some people that you know aren't successful. Think about what that would look like to put that into a presentation. I, I have a feeling that that Stratmore would help you make a more compelling case to all your managers, to all your loan officers, uh, that like, look, when when it looks like this, the call back isn't soon. And I, I know already, you know, speed to lead is going to be one of the single most important things you can do that create conversion and profitability. Um, when when they're not getting options, I know that's going to be another key indicator and, and to what they're doing and how they're doing it. From past Stratmore research, I know that the, well, I guess this wouldn't be secret shopping where you get into the quality of the um, needs analysis. Like you're not secret shopping loans in process. You're you're just secret shopping at the front of the funnel, right? Everything. Yeah. So we're actually, we're currently, we, we've got it kind of um, bookend at the moment that, you know, my group takes care of the front end. My colleague, Mike Seminari with the MCX and the uh, closed loan service, he does a really, really phenomenal job with that. And he asks, you know, several detailed questions uh, on that closed loan survey. And, and so he's able to get the folks that did go through the process on the back end. And what we've had lenders ask us um, recently is, can you put all this together? Can you also have some- I was just thinking are- that same thing, like literally put your front end and that back end, and then create a really compelling presentation to the organization on, look at this, you know, and have real world data. I was like literally thinking that. Yeah. So we're, we're looking right now at some options. I think we have some pretty unique ways to do this. I was just thinking technically how we're working through it. And I, I think we've maybe solved for it is that they said, what if I have my current members of my credit union or my current customers of bank or IMB, um, as someone is actually going through the process, can I have them secret shop and give us feedback as they're going through? And so um, we're working on that third component right now. So we put it all together. Cause like I said, we got the front end all buttoned up and it's, and I always tell people, look, this is not like going into a fast food restaurant and doing a secret shop and saying, you know, was the floor clean and, and did you get, was the food warm and, and was everything correct in your bill? The, uh, on the surface level, this all seems pretty straightforward. The actual infrastructure you have to do to do this correctly, it gets very complicated very quickly you have to be super detail oriented. I think that once we put all three pieces together, the two we have and the one I want to add with with the existing consumers, they're going through the process. I think that really then pulls out the reporting and then you all of a sudden understand your leaky bucket really, really well. All right. So so loan officers, do this yourself. You do not need to wait. I I think this should be great for um, your in planning, strategic planning. Uh, you know, if you've got a team, you can have someone on your team implement this. Uh, so for every top producer, mid-tier producer, every loan officer in America, uh, let's let's do some secret shopping this quarter. Uh, forward this to your leadership team. Um, I think this would be a great exercise for leaders. Uh, branch managers, you, you can, you know, most of you are producing branch managers. So this will be good for your production and good for your leadership, for your organization. Um, for anyone that wants to reach out to you and, you know, engage with you guys to conduct this and, you know, what are you the guy to reach out to? What are the, yeah. what are the best ways of doing that? Yeah. You can send me an email, brett.mccracken at stratmoregroup.com. Um, and, uh, or, you know, type, type me on LinkedIn, but, or you can just go to our website. You can also just fill something out on the, uh, on the website. I need to, I need to test our website actually. Uh, you know, said like the cobbler's kids never have shoes. How fast do we respond? Um, I'm actually not copied on on the uh, inquiries that come from our website, but I know the team's pretty responsive and gets us over. So most people can locate us. If you don't know uh, me directly, you usually know Garth or Jim, uh, Michael Grad, one of the other partners, Nicole. Um, uh, but everybody knows Sue, so you can always reach out through Sue Woodard as well. And she was on a previous uh, episode with you, right? Yeah, Sue? yeah. No, I've interviewed Sue multiple times, but yeah, we interviewed. Uh, just a, a couple of months ago. Well, I'll put a link to Brett's email down below in chat. Also highly recommend that you subscribe to the Stratmore newsletter, uh, go to the website. It's just absolutely uh, pure gold. I mean, if you want to play at the highest level in the mortgage business, 
Uh, it's a must read newsletter. They put it out every month and it's always like, I get it and I schedule time. I study it. It's I highly recommend it. Uh, Brett, any closing thoughts, anything you haven't said that you want to say that you want to make sure gets out in this conversation? Yeah. I think that uh, I get asked all the time, you do all these shops, give me the headline. Um, you know, what is it? It's that there's just a huge opportunity to stand out. That probably is the headline because the average phone calls seem like great calls. When a loan officer says, you found the house you want to buy? Yeah. What's the address? And, and they look it up with you and they go through the photos and they have a really good conversation with you. They answer your questions. Um, you know, they, they make you feel comfortable when you go through. So I think that's the biggest thing is that, you know, pay attention to the parts of your life. If I, I usually do an exercise with, with lenders when I speak. I always ask a question. I'll, I'll ask this actually to you real quick, Dave. Um, what is a brand? It could be, you know, a restaurant, a hotel, a car company, anything. What is a company that you have multiple interact? You've had multiple interactions with them, and you just consistently say it's always a great experience. Is there anybody, any brand you can think of, like local to you, national, that you just really think highly of the experience they give you? Well, I mean, both Apple and Tesla. I mean, I I recently. Um, a couple of days ago, took my, my Tesla. And first of all, buying a Tesla was mind-bogglingly the best experience I've ever had buying a car. And I've taken it into the shop multiple times, you know, without an appointment. And I walk in, if they don't give to me right away, someone's like, oh, we'll be right to you. You know, they, you know, the 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 combination of just nice people saying nice things and then technology. You know, like I'm sitting there across from my service advisor and he, you know, pull up the app. He's sitting here. I'm on my app. He's like, oh, here's your quote. Approve it. Approved. You know, uh, within, I am not kidding. I was in and out of Tesla dropping off my car within 10 minutes with no appointment. Uh, I got multiple text updates while I was waiting for it. I got an updated quote, which in my app, I just approved it. and. You know, two hours before they told me it'd be ready the next day, they said, come on in. I showed up and five minutes later, I'm driving off with my repaired Tesla. And and I've had similar experiences with Apple, just a combination of how they're using technology, how they're using mobile technology, how they have nice, kind, caring people that are truly curious and truly want to help you. Um, both of them have, I've had multiple raving fan experiences this year with. You know, what, what really strikes me about that is they're, they're obviously two ma- you know, global companies. They're, out, they're clearly massive. What you shared with me about Tesla, I have a couple of friends that have them. They, they had the exact same experience. You know, one of them had an issue. Tesla came out to his home and, and took care yeah, of it. I, I Mike could have Seminari, scheduled a home visit, you know. Mike Seminari, he, Stratmore, he wrote a really good piece on his experience with Tesla and how just amazing it was. The buying experience, right? So, there are other car companies out there. They've been around for far longer than Tesla, but I never hear about someone saying, boy, I had an unbelievable experience when I bought a car and I went to BMW or I went to Mercedes, right? It's this long drawn out, you know, kind of uncomfortable process typically. Um, and the same thing with Apple. I remember I, I bought something from there. I did it online, did it on my phone, in fact. And I went down the street, picked it up and was out the door immediately. It was just a really good experience. And I think to myself, we have all these experiences across the country, but it's the same company, right? There's not that many permutations yet. If you call a bank, it really is a roll of the dice of what the experience you're going to have. There is no consistency. We shop the same companies eight, nine, 10 times, and we don't hear the same things, right? There's there's no consistency to it. So there's no franchised model typically to banking. When you go and you have an experience with somebody, you don't know what you're going to get. Um and so I think that's a really that's a really good takeaway point, which is it is possible to do it. I would like to see companies spend a lot of time really thinking through from the moment they pick up the phone or they fill out the call me or they go in the online application. What is that consumer going to experience going to be and how is it going to be optimal and how is it going to be consistent? That's what I'd be focusing on right now, because when the market turns and it will, there's going to be survivalists. They're going to start making a lot of money again. The question is, are they going to have repeat customers who come back to them because they're having a Tesla type experience that you just described? 
Yeah. And, and my closing thought on this is guys, you could have this today. I interviewed uh, Daniel saw who is with NFM lending his branch of 35 loan officers in Columbus, Ohio is averaging 6.4 loans per month per loan officer, which is like triple the industry average. Yeah. Um, his, his branch has become the number one market leader in central uh, Ohio, uh, taking out Rocket, taking out Huntington Bank, you know, these legacy, massive global brands, and he's the number one market leader. And it's, it's they, you guys have the technology now. Like most lenders, you know, they have a digital way to take an app. You know, so they've got apps. They've, you know, if you've got mortgage coach, you've got a digital way to deliver options that integrates with your app. Uh, and you have great technology, but your loan officers aren't using it consistently. You know, so you take a Daniel Saw, and, and by the way, his conversion rates, his 35 loan officers conversion rates are, you know, leading in the industry. Um, their profitability and basis points are like 85 basis points more profitable than those that don't. So, Everybody has it now. You just, first of all, you got a secret shop so that you truly have a benchmark of where you're at as an organization. And then you need to bring that data inside. I will add a, a fifth step here, guys. So planning, engaging, documenting, presenting, and then five, changing, you know, like changing and implementing the actions that you had. And, and, and you have it right now, guys, like the mortgage industry does not need to be losing money, even in this brutal market. Like if you did this secret shopping and you took action on it, everybody could be profitable right now in the most brutal market in history. If you just had your loan officers following their best practices and leveraging the technology that you spend millions on that they don't use, you know, you're spending millions on technology that is not being used appropriately. So Brett, I love this conversation. I hope we keep it going. I hope next time you and I are doing this, we're, we've got you, me, and a mutual client. And we're kind of like, we're sharing a case study of how you did some secret yeah. shopping. And we have some data to share. And we can just keep this conversation going. Yeah, well, I appreciate it. It's a good topic to talk about. And uh, I think it's really important. Right? I mean, consumers have a lot of options out there. They have a lot of choices. And you, as I said, you can just really stand out from the moment you say hello. There's a there's a big opportunity for people to differentiate themselves. So appreciate what you're doing. Appreciate the enthusiasm you continue to have. How long have you been in the industry for? This I don't know if this is my 38th or 39th year, but <laughs> since 1986, do the math. That is uh, that is hard to find folks who have been in the industry as long and still have the enthusiasm and passion that you do. And I do find that remarkable, right? It'd be easy to say, oh, I've been doing this for a long time, whatever. But I do watch your uh, your videos. And of course, I see you at conferences. And I see you present. And you do not lose the energy um, for for this for this industry. And so I, I tip, if I had a hat, I would tip of the hat to you. <laughs> I will appreciate that. Well, you know, I, I, I'm a... I'm I'm a for-profit entrepreneur, but I also have a purpose, and that is to change how people get into debt in America. You know, as a as an industry, we can be the first responders to the financial literacy crisis, and and I've kind of made it a a professional purpose to like let's elevate lending so that when families get into debt, they get options, they get education. And uh, so hopefully everybody gets value from this. Remember, all you loan officers, share this with your managers. Branch managers lead by example and heads of production and AC suite leaders that listen to this. Hopefully you'll reach out to, to Brett, have a discovery call. And uh, hopefully maybe you will be someone that we, uh, we bring into one of these interviews. Anyways, Brett, love the conversation. Have a good one, brother. You too. See you, Dave. Bye. Take care.